so let's talk about our phonology calendar and um you know let's see so you're on your computer doing zoom but you probably have um, your phone close by um, and so we're going to talk about how you can access this calendar if you've never used it before what it means um, and I, I should have put it up here on the screen for you but the easiest way to get to the calendar is um, is the letters gdd so if you put this in your google search bar it doesn't have to be in the http bar um, but just in your search bar, search for GDD, as in Growing Degree Day, so GDD, and then a space, and then OSU. Um, and this should be the first choice that comes up, the Ohio State Phonology Calendar. So what this calendar does, um, you put your zip code in. You can put a zip code anywhere in the state of Ohio. You have to be a Buckeye to do this. Um, it defaults out to today's date, but you can put past dates in here. Um, and then you say, show me the calendar. Um, and what it does is drops you into the calendar. So I actually did this um, this afternoon for um, for Mason. So I did 45040 um, for today's date. And um, it drops me onto this screen and it shows me this is the um, this is the GDD or the growing degree day, which is a measure of accumulated heat. So what it's showing me is that here in Mason, we have about 96 growing degree day units that have accumulated. So that's a heat measure. And what's on the left are things that have already happened. Um, now they may not be in my yard. Maybe I don't have a forsythia in my yard, but in my area close to me, somewhere close to that zip code in Mason, um, Northern Lights forsythia, which is a cultivar of forsythia should be blooming. Uh, Manchu cherries are blooming and Eastern tent caterpillar. Well, the, the webbing won't be this big, but those eggs have started to hatch out, right? It's going to be later that this webbing shows up. Um, but right now what we would see is um, the eggs have hatched. And then what's to the right of this is um, those things that are about to happen. So speckled alder, these are actually the female portions of, of the fruits. Um, but we, what we would see are the catkins and I have a picture to show you. Um, Cornelian cherry dogwood, I mentioned, full bloom, and then Norway maple, first bloom. So these things are about to come, but um, what I always encourage folks to do is to um, look outside, right? Because it could be where you are. Um, your Norway maple is already in first bloom. Um, maybe you're a little more than first bloom, right? So you have to do a little bit of ground truthing. Uh, with the calendar because you may be a little ahead or you may be a little behind depending on um, you know how exposed are you are you down in a little um, little valley are you in an urban area that has a you know kind of a heat island effect and is pushing things ahead a little faster so now if i click on view full calendar it's going to drop me into this screen okay so here i am in mason on um, on this day in the calendar 96 growing degree days and everything above that black bar is what has already happened or should have already happened. And what's below the black bar is what is about to happen. Okay. So this calendar was developed by Dr. Dan Herms, who's now the head of uh, research at Davy Tree. He used to be at the um, OSU Department of Entomology. He was our chair for many years. And he created what I like to think of as a big scroll. And um, so which plant activities were happening, which bloom activities, what bloom now and what bloom next and what bloomed after that, um, he put on this scroll along with these insect activities and mostly insects of ornamental plants. So pests of ornamental plants, because um, that's what Dan's background is. And so he created this gray long scroll that starts with the first bloom of silver maple. So pretty early in the season, you know, for you all, maybe early March, um, the first um, silver maple was in bloom all the way through to Rose of Sharon. And if you're a gardener, you know, that's kind of a, you know, heat of the summer kind of plant. Um, so this long scroll over 45 different insect species and close to 100 plant species. Uh, first bloom and full bloom. And so, as I said, anywhere you are in the state, you um, you can put your zip code in. Um, you get this, um, this list. So the plant uh, instances on here, it's hard to tell with a screenshot, but they're in normal type and the um, insects are in bold. It's a little clear if it's in front of you on your phone, maybe you can see that. 
And then you can click on any of these, you know, if you're not sure what a large case bear is or an exotic ambrosia beetle, you can click on those, um, or you're not sure what one of the plants is, for example, the Sergeant Cherry, um, you can click on that and you should get at least a picture of that. Um, sometimes you'll get a link to a fact sheet. So if I click on summary, so again, here I am in, um, in Mason, and we said we had 97 growing degree date. Was it 97 or 87? I have a terrible short-term memory. 96, that was pretty close. Uh, let me tell you what the growing degree day unit means. So this 96 doesn't mean we've had 96 warm days or there've been 96 warm days since January. What happens with the calendar is we zero out the growing degree day units in January. So we say there are zero heat units that have accumulated on January 1. And for every day when we have an average daily temperature above 50 degrees, there's a formula that calculates how many heat units we've added that day. So if we have a very warm day, we may add 10 in, in spring, we may add 10 growing degree day units um, if tomorrow it's another fairly warm day, maybe we accumulate five growing degree day units, but we add that to 10 from yesterday. And so it's a growing, um, it's a, an accumulated number. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna go into the formula of how that's calculated tonight, although you can go through on the website and get more information about that. Um, the nice thing is you never have to calculate your own growing degree day units unless you want to. Um, the calendar does that for you. So I can click um, anywhere on the calendar, I can click on summary. So if you're like me, it's hard to remember, um, you know, what last year was, well, yeah, last year was, we don't want to remember last year at all, but it's hard to remember, you know, was it a slow spring or a fast spring? I'm just not good at, at remembering from year to year. So if you click on summary, um, summary will give you the last um, six years in your zip code and it'll show, it'll compare how many growing degree day units had accumulated in those other years. Okay, so here we are this year at 96 units. Um, last year, we already had 164 growing degree day units that accumulated on this date last year. So we were a little bit further ahead last year. So it was a little warmer, uh, or we had some warmer days that accumulated those units faster. Um, 2019, we only had 81, pretty close. Um, and you can see, oh, 2017, we were at 189. So that one was, um, you know, significantly um, faster than this spring. And 2015, you know, slower or cooler with only 47 growing degree days. And so you can do that any date that you uh, put into the calendar, you can click on that summary and just get a sense of how does this compare, you know, to, to prior years. So, um, oh, my arrow moved, but the arrow should be right here by the Buckeye State. Um, I, I like to put this, um, I usually put the arrow a little closer in because of course, as I said, this only works for zip codes in Ohio, but if you live close enough, right, you're just across the border or you're, um, you know, here into West Virginia or Pennsylvania or what have you. I had someone, um, a beekeeper email me and he lived in Indianapolis and he's like, I love this idea. Um, and I'd like to be able to use the calendar, but I don't, uh, you know, what do I do? We don't have this in Indiana. And so I said, well, look, let's look here. If we find Indiana and we draw a line over, we can get a really close zip code in Ohio, and then you'll just follow their calendar and ground truth, right? So maybe, you know, it turns out it's a little cooler in um, Ohio than in Indianapolis, maybe with the city. Um, so just, you know, wherever you fall into the scroll, kind of do some ground truthing and say, well, actually, you know what, I'm closer to the here. My um, Chanticleer calorie pears are just coming into bloom or um, Japanese pyrus is in full bloom or what have you. And um, you can kind of just adjust a little bit in the way you think about this, this calendar. So what's cool about the calendar is that the sequence is always the same. And once you get used to that idea, that's really the power of the phonology calendar, is that this sequence or this scroll that Dan helped to, to detail for us always stays the same. What changes from year to year is the pace at which we go through those that sequence, right? So if it's a really warm spring, we have you know maybe 80 degree temperatures next week. I don't think that's gonna happen, but, um, but it could, right? And so we would go through that scroll much faster than if it turns back into 40 degree days, um, things just kind of sit still, right, until it gets warm again. 
So an adaptable calendar that um, that you can use across, um, you know, kind of across the Midwest. Sometimes I, I give webinars for folks outside of Ohio, and there are ways that they can kind of transfer their regions into um, the Ohio calendar. But there's really, you know, it's a place where we can be really proud of what Ohio State offers. There's really no other state that has such a cool calendar. And so we'll, we'll walk through uh, the season a little bit and look at some of those um, those plants that happen to be good pollinator plants. So I mentioned that you know this wasn't developed uh, with pollinators or, or honeybees in mind. This calendar was developed to help people track and manage pests of ornamental plants. And so uh, many of the, pl the the plants are oh they're all trees and shrubs so they're all woody ornamentals. Uh, many of them are native. Some of them are non-native. And um, of course, many of the pests are, are non-native. Um, and so you're not going to find, you know, a list. This is not a list of which plants are great for honeybees, uh, but many of them are really good pollinator plants and um, will help you kind of fill in um, the gap through the season. Um, but let's first turn to how, um, how all bees nest and forage. Okay, so bees are what we call central place foragers. So your hive, wherever your hive is going, that's the central place, whether it's in your backyard or you have an apiary, maybe some, um, some acreage or, or that your apiary is on a farm, that hive is the central place. So for this little bee that looks a little bit more like a bunny in here, just cute little bunny face, um, this little mason bee, this tube is the central place. Okay, so I think that's a male because males have yellow um, fuzzy mustaches. But if this were a female or maybe this female that came out of this tunnel, that tunnel is the central place. That's where she's provisioning cells for her young. And she leaves that, that nest and forages out from there. Um, mason bees can, the, the females only go about 800 uh, feet from that central place, so they can't forage very far. And they bring that food then back to that central place. So that's the whole idea of central place foragers. They live, where they live is the, cent the central place and they forage in a radius out from there, right? So like all bees, it sort of depends how hungry the honeybees are, you know, how, how many resources are close by um, will really tell how far they go they're gonna go. So if there are a lot of resources around you, there are a lot of flowers blooming and um, they're offering what they need, pollen or nectar, um, they're gonna go ve not very far from that central place. Um, but if they need food, they can't find it. They're just like us, remember when we used to go on road trips? Uh, we keep driving until we get the, you know, whatever, the Panera on the interstate or something, uh, we're gonna go farther because we need food. We're gonna keep going. So let's look at a really cool study that was done a couple years ago in Great Britain that really gives us a feel for that idea of central place foragers. Um, this is using um, bumblebees. So uh, you may have seen bumblebees that come in a, in a box, uh, like a paper box from Staples, and you can put them out in the, um, in the, in the field. Say you have blueberries um, or an orchard crop, apples or something, you can buy a bumblebee hive and put it out in the hive. And then usually we, um, those hives are destroyed at the end of the year and you order new bumbles next year. So for this study, the researchers glued these um, little radar trackers to the abdomen of these bumblebees. So bumblebees, big and robust, the workers can take this extra weight on here, it's not a problem. Um, and then they have um, a, a radar to, um, to monitor where are these bees going. So they take this paper box full of bumblebees. Um, some of the workers have the trackers on them. They put them out in the middle of the field. Okay, so the place where the nest went down is the blue dot here on the left. Um, and these are four different um, individuals that were tracked. Um, so if we look at this bee up here, um, for every bout or trip that that worker bee took from that central place, from that hive, um, that was tracked on the radar. And the researchers coded that color um, according to whether they were the first trips, which are in green, um, the middle trips of that bee's life, or the final trips. And all these bees, um, you know, they didn't come back for whatever reason. Um, they died or they flew off. Okay, so they're central place foragers. The, the real point behind um, kind of emphasizing this with honeybees is 
and I want you to plant habitat. I want you to put as many flowers on any property that you manage as you can to, to provide that food for uh, for your bees. So whether that's a you know half acre of buckwheat or it's a few aster plants on your deck, um, those flowers are going to make a difference. But on the other hand, we're, we're not realistically going to be able to plant enough acres to, to be all the food, to provide all the food that those bees need because they're, they're, the community is their neighborhood and they're really foraging far from that hive. And we don't know exactly where they're going. Um, we can't be Tom Seeley and uh, figure out where all those bees are going um, and bringing that food back to the colony. And we said before that a varied diet is um, is the most important for honeybees, that they are the healthiest when they have lots of different kinds of, of flowers that they're visiting, bringing back lots of different, you know, different pollen compositions, um, lots of those different secondary metabolites and vitamins and minerals um, that help to um, in, in increase the hive health. So the, just want to really emphasize then the importance of trees and shrubs for that season long bloom. Um, often when we think of, you know, I want to put in some pollinator habitat, lots of people email me and they might be thinking of a meadow, of a, you know, a field of herbaceous perennials. Um, but if we're not thinking about those trees, we're mi really missing a big chunk of the growing season. Because in Ohio, our native perennials really aren't doing a lot in, um, especially in, in sunny meadow situations, they're not really blooming until mid to late summer. It's our trees that are doing the lion's share of the work as far as providing pollen and nectar um, early in the season. So since you're in kind of a, a southern portion of the state, I wanted to put to refer to this bulletin in case you haven't seen it from um, the University of Kentucky, where they've done a lot of really great research, Stan Potter's lab, looking at um, uh, trees and shrubs um, that are bee friendly in that Ohio Valley region. And so of course, Ohio's a pretty big state. And so some of the plants that grow well for you may not grow well in, you know, Ashtabula County or Lucas County and other corners of the state. Um, so you may want to check out this, uh, this bulletin. You can just put this in uh, Woody Ornamentals in, um, and if you search for Daniel, for Dan Potter's lab, you're going to find some of their resources. And they've actually gone out and, you know, really monitored these plants for bee visitation. Not all the lists out there um, do that. So I think this is a really um, a nice piece of information for those of you from the southern stretches of, of the state. So let's walk through a little bit um, of the season. This is um, alder and um, alders are, are blooming right now for me in Stark County. Um, probably you, you've seen them already this year. And so they produce these uh, male catkins. This is where the pollen is produced, which really brings an interesting point about trees and, uh, and bees. And so some of our trees that are wind pollinated like alder, or I mentioned oaks earlier, um, ash are wind pollinated. So those wind pollinated plants, although they don't attract, um, uh, they don't need bees to move their pollen around, right? They're wind pollinated. So they're putting all of these catkins out and on uh, breezy days, all that pollen is, uh, is you know, floating in the wind, um, giving us spring allergies, but, um, um, you know, easily taking that pollen to other um, portions of that, that plant that have the female flowers, right? And so, um, uh, and so bees aren't needed for pollination, but that doesn't mean that bees aren't visiting to gather pollen. Okay, so our maples, um, you know, this is the male portion of the maple flower with all the pollen, but this is the female portion, so uh, we can have nectar and pollen as a reward um, early in the season. Uh, and so here's a red maple, and again, uh, we don't think of this as being a bee plant, but when there's nothing else blooming, the bees are definitely going to visit uh, maples and, and bring that pollen back. This is the decornian cherry dogwood that I mentioned already. Um, here's the the flowers. Here's the you know the proof that the honeybees love this plant. If you have one in your yard or close by, and when that plant is blooming in late winter, you're going to see um, you know it's warm enough uh, for honeybees to visit. There's going to be honeybees all over that plant. All right, then we're up to willow. So we're just kind of walking through the season to see what blooms when. Uh, my pussy willows are in bloom right now. Yours may be a little past. 
Willows have separate uh, male and female plants. And so obviously the male plants, the male flowers very heavy in pollen and um, the females are gonna have more of that nectar reward. But lots of different bees are gonna visit willows. Uh, they're, they're really great, uh, great native plants. Those farm fields that have that hint of uh, pink on them, uh, maybe that's happening right now for you. It's just starting up here. I noticed today on a, on a drive at lunch, um, that's uh, purple dead nettle primarily, although it's closely related to henbit. So remember the mint family, really, um, really great for bees. Again, if it's a warm enough day that your honeybees are flying, they're probably visiting purple dead nettle. I mentioned the cherries and there are all kinds of cherries. So ornamental cherries uh, or edible cherries, really easy for bees to visit, right? These um, open five petals, very accessible anthers, um, nectaries right in here. Here's a great big uh, queen bumblebee. And if we just check into the calendar, right? So remember I said this is a great big scroll that started with the um, silver maple first bloom. And if I look here, we're at about 145 uh, growing degree day um, heat units that have accumulated for that first bloom of the, the weeping Huygen cherry. Um, here's service berry in bloom, so a great native tree. Um, here's a um, kind of a view of some of the habits. So a multi-stem tree. We have lots of different species in North America. There are also some horticultural varieties, some that are you know smaller or columnar or tighter for different um, locations, but a great pollen and nectar plant. And I have to tell you why um, service berry got its name. You already may already know this story, but um, in the phenology world, this is the poster child of uh, phenology uh, because the association was historically when um, you know we lost folks during the winter our community had uh, deaths and we couldn't bury um, anyone in the cemetery we couldn't dig the grave because uh, we didn't have the the ways in the old days and so we had to kind of wait for um, the the funeral service and the way that we timed that was when the service berry was in bloom so when the service berry is in bloom that means the soil has thawed enough that uh, we can dig the grave and hold the funeral service. So that's how Service Berry uh, got its name. Okay, so we're still um, going through the season. So dandelions coming in bloom um, right around the time that mustards are in bloom. In fact, in this image, we have both of them. And sometimes these plants are called the spring yellows. Then we have red buds in bloom. Um, lots of different bees will visit red buds. Um, same with apples, uh, and, and that's true whether it's crab apples or, or um, uh, orchard apples, um, really great nectar and pollen sources. Lots of different kinds of bees. There's actually um, a study out of Cornell. I think they identified something like 130 different kinds of, of bees, um, wild bees that came to uh, apple orchards in New York State. So Dr. Uh, Reed Johnson is associated with the entomology department. He's a, a professor in our department. And you've probably seen Reed at, um, at the Southwest uh, Beekeeper School or at other beekeeping events, or maybe you've seen him online here lately, but does some really great research about um, honeybees and what they're foraging on. And so did some research a few years ago where they um, they used uh, pollen traps to gather pollen from honeybees that were out in kind of the central and, and um, uh, southwestern portions of the state. And then they analyzed what those pollen sources were. At that time, they were doing uh, microscopic work with the pollen to, to figure out, you know, the, they stain the pollen. It does, it's not that color under the microscope, but they stain it so they can see the different characteristics and then figure out what species the, of plant that pollen comes from. And they sort out those pollen balls by color. Um, there are um, sad undergraduate students um, who are uh, employed to sort out all those pollen balls by color and then, uh, and then they stain and, um, and analyze that pollen to figure out what plant it came from. Now they use um, something called DNA barcoding where they can do some genetic analysis of all the pollen in, um, in that sample that the bees have collected. So um, they're really light years ahead with uh, you know, figuring out which plants all that pollen came from. 
But from this period, so if you remember a few years ago, uh, we had some honeybee death because of uh, corn dust. And so Dr. Johnson was really interested in what else is in bloom uh, when corn is being planted. And um, uh, so are honeybees visiting flowers that may have that, um, that pesticide dust on them um, because of the corn planting, and then they're bringing that back to the colony. And so he found that at this uh, at the same time that um, that corn was um, he, he sampled over uh, several weeks in um, late April and in May of this particular year and found that uh, many of those plants were these the dead nettle that I just mentioned the dandelion um, ash so you know interestingly that um, that wind borne pollen but still a, a important food source and hawthorns, which are in the apple family, really um, great resource for honeybees. And then he did this really cool graph here that shows, again, the time is down here from April through mid-May. And um, so if you take any slice here from this sample on May 2nd, we can see that a lot of the pollen was, uh, was pink here. So um, that's from our rosaceous plants, that's our apples and our hawthorns. Um, but some was also up here, dandelion and mustards, and then a lot of it here was orange, the ash, um, and some kind of declining, but still the maples. And so it just gives us this really interesting picture of how those floral resources change over time, right? So in early May, you know, a few days after um, the very beginning of May, the apple the rosaceous pollen, so plants in the rose family, the apples and, and cherries, most of the pollen in this study was coming from those plants. Um, you know, our maples were pretty much done by that point, and here the willows hadn't picked up yet. So, um, so just wanted to um, kind of emphasize this really cool work that's coming out of OSU. And if you look for Dr. Reed Johnson's uh, papers, you'll, you'll read more about um, the, the work. They're actually studying um, soybean and how soybean pollen is used uh, by bees and nectar. And here's a up close of those ash flowers, right? Not showy, they're not colorful. Um, that's because they're not trying to attract any pollinators. They're just throwing all their pollen to the wind, um, just like oak, cat oak catkins do. Okay, here's our hawthorns that, um, that Reed um, illuminated for us. And then our blueberries coming into bloom. Um, definitely some of our weeds are so important for honeybees and sweet clover is, um, you know, it's not a, um, it's not a plant we want to grow on purpose. Somebody actually wanted to, they called me a couple years ago and they wanted to grow a field of sweet clover. And, you know, we don't usually do that. It's hard to grow weeds on purpose. They're not, um, they're, they're not easy to tame and um, and you no, know, not usually that successful, but they can be a really important plant um, out there in nature. Then we're up to tulip tree, uh, a, an amazing nectar source. Um, here's that tulip flower open wide. It's in the magnolia family, so similar uh, structure to star magnolia that might be just done blooming for you or um, saucer magnolia, the pink one that's about to start. Um, so primarily a nectar. Um, sorry, primarily a, um, well, I guess it's both, both pollen and um, pollen and nectar source. So another great nectar source are black locusts, but they're kind of unreliable for beekeepers. There'll be a great year where there's lots of nectar from black locust, um, and then another year, um, not, not so much. So not a, a, a super reliable source from year to year. If we check back into the calendar, okay, so here's our black locust. And uh, we see we're at about 467 growing degree day units, heat units that have accumulated. So one way you could use this calendar is uh, every um, couple days, um, and you can you know put punch it into your phone, um, or we don't have an app, but you can you know be on your um, Google on your phone, put in the GDD and OSU, kind of see where you fall. And let's say you're waiting for black locust. You really want to, to focus on that black locust uh, nectar. And so you're using this as a target for when to make sure your honey supers are on, right? You're getting them on so the bees are, are bringing back that resource, have plenty of space to, um, to, to make that honey. 
Little Leaf Linden, another great um, nectar source. This is a non-native tree, but you may be more familiar with our native basswood um, uh, related to, um, to the um, Little Leaf Linden, uh, but just uh, really, really loved by honeybees. And you can smell these, you know, it's a forest tree, um, really uh, rich, sweet uh, fragrance on this tree.